Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining our webinar on going back to school. Uh, I'm Emily Crossley, co-founder and CEO of Duchenne UK, and I'm also joined by phone tonight by my co-founder, um, Alex Johnson. Unfortunately, she's having some problems with her Wi-Fi, something to do with a cow walking into an electricity pile in the field behind her house. So, Alex, um, I hope you're there. I know you've got terrible reception, but we're hoping that you're going to chair the Q&A section later. So um, uh, let's hope that your phone line holds out. Um, so thanks for joining tonight. Tonight's webinar is about preparing our community for going back to school. And we're very lucky to be joined by Nick Catlin and Dr. Janet Hoskin. They both set up Action Duchenne. They now sit on Duchenne UK's Patient Advisory Board. And Nick Catlin runs the Cypher, and Janet is a senior lecturer in special education at the University of East London. Uh, we decided to hold this webinar because although the government has issued general advice about going back to school, I think what we found as a community during this crisis is that our needs are often left until last, and there's a lot of confusion and uncertainty which leads to anxiety. So we wanted to um, hold this webinar to give you some things to think about before going back to school. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to have all the answers to every question. Um, and I think, you know, what we're kind of try and do is give you a roadmap, if you like, for making the best decision that you feel is the right one for you and your family for going back to school. And there's not going to be a one size fits all. You know, some schools have issued advice on wearing face masks. Others have said you don't need to. Um, so there's not going to be a one solution for everyone. It's about giving you the information you need to make the decision for yourselves and your family. So I'm going to hand over to Nick now, who's going to start off with a little bit of an overview of what our rights are and what things we need to be considering um, in the coming weeks. So um, thanks for joining, Nick, and it's over to you. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, can we have the first slide? Great, thank you. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, this has been described as an enormously challenging task, and I think that's probably an understatement. But um really tonight is about is it safe to return to school and uh you know what what can we do to try and make the return to school in september as safe as possible for our uh young people with duchenne muscular dystrophy i i, I think this is really really important because the first slide here is we've got to rem remind ourselves that all young people with duchenne muscular dystrophy have a right to full-time education. And as Alex, uh, sorry, as Emily just said, uh, quite often our young people or people with disabilities get kind of pushed right to the back of the queue uh, and quite often, you know, completely left out in terms of, uh, you know, trying to make uh, provision for them. So it's important that this is where we're starting from. Now, uh, also, in law, a school or college or university must make reasonable adjustments to make sure disabled students are not discriminated against. And that's, that's very, very important. Uh, and it's a legal right that all disabled people have, that institutions must make adjustments to meet their needs. Now, our young people, uh, students, have an education, health and care plan. And this education, health and care plan, which I seem to be going banging on about for a long time now, but it's in, it really, in, you know, in this COVID situation, it comes to the fore uh, and is really, really, really important for a number of reasons. One is because uh, the provision, uh, the assessments and provision are enshrined in law and these must be delivered. Although there was a, a bit of a hiatus when um, the education, health, and care plans were were kind of put on hold. That that's now been cleared during lockdown. Uh, yeah, during lockdown, uh, as Janet said, and, and that's that's now been cleared. And you know, these are anything you've got in an education, health, and care plan now, particularly in sections B and F, are mandatory. And so bear that in mind. Uh, if you're not getting what's in your plan you know you you really need to push for it and uh, uh because it's it's your son's legal right to have that now the covid 19 pandemic uh 
you know, it's led to months of lockdown. It's meant loss of education. It's meant uh, our young people have been isolated in lot for, for many weeks from friends and extended family. Uh, certainly from that point of view, I think a lot of young people, and uh, probably a lot of us parents are, you know, really looking forward to the, uh, our young people going back to school. But it, you know, is it safe to return? And what can we do to make sure uh, that things are in place to ensure it is a, a safe return? Janet, did you want to say something? No, no, I just, okay. did you do that? Yeah, or? no, next slide, please. Okay, so just a bit of background. The government have published guidelines for return to school in September, and you know you, you can check those out. Um, also, check out this, this is very important your local authority website for local advice. For instance, I was talking to Alex earlier in the week, and then, and she told me that Greater Manchester has very different uh, is in a very different COVID situation to other places in the country and you know changes like you know you're going to get local outbreaks and so on so it's important to keep uh, an eye on what your local authority is uh, is giving you and there might be somebody in your local authority who has responsibility for extremely clinically vulnerable young people i know that in our local authority there is somebody that you can talk to about um, about return to school. So it's worth finding out who that person is. It doesn't seem to be well advertised though. Yeah, the uh, third thing is the joint public sector unions have produced guidelines. That's the teaching unions and all the staff that work in school uh, have produced joint guidelines for return to school. And it's them that describe this as an enormously challenging task. Uh, and uh, they are, those joint union guidance are well worth looking at because they are very, very comprehensive. They, they're, they're there to try and protect uh, not only members of staff working in school, but also our children. So they're well worth checking out. Yep, next. Okay, so what do we do? In the first instance, it's really important uh, to contact your head teacher of your school, principal of, of your college, because every school or college should by now have undertaken a risk assessment. Um, and that should be available to you, uh, to your family. You should be able to see that. You should be able to see, you know, what the head teacher, for example, is, is going to put in place. Um, but a qu the first question to ask them as well, uh, once you've had a chance to look at it and we'll go through some points of things to look for in that risk assessment but has the process also included risk assessment for individual pupils identified as at greater risk which will be our young people uh, with Duchenne so individual risk assessments uh, should um, have been undertaken and should be in place now as part of your son's education health and care plan have you agreed an individual risk assessment in the past? Uh, because, um, you know, certainly with people who've contacted us at Decipher, we've always urged you to uh, work with the school, co-produce um, a risk assessment, you know, that covers things like what happens if your son falls, what are the accident and emergency procedures, you know, is there safe equipment, you know, are stairs negotiable, all that sort of thing. But with COVID coming in, there are, there are further risks that, that need to be um, assessed for your individual son. And these are, um, as Emily said right at the beginning, these are individual. No two boys with Duchenne are the same. No two boys are going through the, uh, you know, the, um, the development of the, the condition in the same kind of way. So, uh, one of the things to consider, uh, very important, is uh, your neuromuscular consultant's assessment of risk. You know, for example, to things like lowering the immune response and so on and so on, risk of respiratory infections. But you know that that's something that only a neuromuscular specialist consultant can advise you on your son. So it, as part of your individual risk assessment. I strongly urge you to get in contact as soon as possible with your 
with your neuromuscular consultant and, um, and get a letter from them that can add to an individual risk assessment for your son. Okay. Right. So uh, just going through, so this is a bit of a checklist really. Um, so the first thing is what protective measurement measures do the school have in place uh, for the return in September? So do they, for example, it, you know, in their, in their risk assessment, their school risk assessment for all pupils, you know, will they, you know, have they got in place uh, procedures for minimizing contact with pupils or staff, you know, who may become unwell, they might have a temperature, they might not be diagnosed straight away with COVID, you know, what, you know, what's in place to make sure that pupils and staff uh, are not having contact with people who become unwell and what, you know, and what are the procedures that are going to follow that? Cleaning of hands, you know, sanitizers, wash basins, are those, are those uh, facilities in, in place and freely available? Have they, you know, talked to, the, talked to the kids and staff about catching coughs and sneezes in tissues and binning it? Uh, you know, simple procedures that can help to stop the spread of the virus. Is there going to be enhanced school cleaning? Uh, is that going to be once a week or is it, you know, our classrooms going to be cleaned every single day? I mean, you know, this is obviously a key policy that's going to keep the virus uh, away or down. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about social contact and dis distancing, but what are the social contact and distancing policies and, and procedures? I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, wearing masks and gloves is that now at the moment um, this isn't compulsory uh, but you know in Scotland where Scotland since they've reopened schools has seen you know spikes in um, staff and children in certain schools uh, contracting uh, Covid uh, some 17 staff I think and children were diagnosed with the virus in, in a special school uh, so, I mean, that's a measure of the kind of risks that, that we are facing. Uh, and Scotland are bringing in, uh, apparently, the, not at the minute, but they're going to bring in wearing face coverings and, and PPE, well, uh, face coverings in corridors. Yeah, I think in, in corridors and, and outside areas, uh, I'm not sure whether that's going to be secondary and primary, um, but uh, England are talking about um, following suit but there's 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 nothing compulsory um, ab about that yet my personal opinion is you know young people should wherever possible be wearing face coverings and staff should be wearing face coverings and gloves wherever possible uh, test and trace uh, it's a fiasco so we you know uh, no home kits left. there are no home kits available at the minute they've run out um, what the government are proposing is kind of mobile test and trace units to go around schools where there's a potential outbreak to, to test everybody but I've got no idea how that's going to work but testing and tracing is obviously really really important um, and, and you know we really do need to to find out what the school is going to do and how it's how it will firstly respond to managing any kind of outbreak and what it's going to do to containing uh, an outbreak this should all be uh, documented in the school's risk assessment so ask the seer uh, if these things aren't in the risk assessment then you, you need to ask questions of the head teacher um, and try and get them you know implemented bear in mind as well that schools uh that the teachers union and other unions have a will be appointing or should be appointing health and safety uh coordinators in schools and colleges uh and they should be going through checking these things with the head to make sure these things are in uh, are in place okay next Right, what social distancing measures are in place? Okay, now your school will, will probably uh, have some kind of method of social distancing. So they might be, you know, form groups on a certain corridor or year groups, or they, th there might be bubbles of, 
uh, uh, pupils who have to stay together and so on. So you need to check out, you know, what they are, how do they operate and, uh, you know, how do they operate particularly at break times uh, and dinner times and make sure, you know, that you're happy, uh, you know, that they're putting in place social distancing measures as best uh, as they can. That it is going to depend on the size of the school, uh, you know, how much room they got, how big the corridors, so there's a whole bunch of factors. And it, so it, it's again, uh, school by school. So you really do need to find out. Classrooms, what's the setup in classrooms? Uh, how many pupils are gonna be in a room? Is there social distancing? Uh, and so on. I talked a bit about school and break times. Uh, for us, a, a big question is how will your son work one-to-one -one with teaching assistants, learning support assistants, support their learning and behaviour in the classroom, keeping them on task and, uh, are and so that, on. They? Yeah, uh, again, it, it's going to be variable. Some schools seem to be uh, not implementing TAs working all at all. Others uh, seem to have agreements uh, in place. Go back to your um, education, health and care plan. If your son has uh, provision, one-to-one -one provision with a teaching assistant, you should be insisting that some way a teaching assistant is going to be working with your son uh, in a classroom, socially distanced, but helping you know your son with their work as, as best they possibly can, um, that would be my my recommendation. Uh, arriving and leaving school, uh, you know there will be social distancing. Well, there should should be social distancing measures. Um, you know they they might be staggered times. You need to check all those sorts of things out. And are you are you happy with it? Transport to school is a big one for our young people. Uh, because many of our young people need transport in some form or another. Okay, so it can vary from taxis to buses to, uh, you know, specialist, uh, you know, transport uh, into school. Now, again, from what I can see is that there's no mandatory requirement to wear face masks or or any sorts of policies. It, it's kind of been left up to bus companies and various other providers you know again in my opinion uh, you know staff and young people if they're coming together on a school bus should be wearing face masks you know there should be hand gelling you know the the transport should be clean and uh, and, and, and managed properly uh, so, but you need to find out and you need to find out what what's happening in terms of transport in your school yep next um, Nick, just before we go on to the next slide, can I yep. just ask a quick question on PPE? Are we allowed to insist that our children's learning support assistants or TAs wear PPE? Uh, uh, well, at, at the moment, there, <coughs> you know, the government kind of guidelines aren't making it mandatory. I think I think that's going to change. And I think it will be, well, certainly in Scotland, they're going to make it mandatory in certain areas. Uh, you know, but it will be difficult if a head says, no, it's not mandatory, so we're not going to do it. But you, there's nothing to say that, you know, your son can't wear a face mask into school and that you could ask, request, you know, I would imagine most TAs who are working with your son will want to wear a face mask and probably gloves or certainly uh, you know other protective clothing it, you know because they're, they're going to spend quite a lot of time you know with them uh, so I would you know I would advise people to try and insist on uh, you know wearing face masks uh, because even if no one else is wearing them it does well face coverings it does um, offer a level of protection against the spread of the virus and quite often it's about virus load so even if the virus gets into the school you know we're trying to minimize the amount or the, if you like the quantity of virus that anybody including our boys might get because it's virus load the amount they get kind of the density of it that seems to be you know uh, a bigger factor in whether 
whether young people become or older people certainly become ill. So all of these measures are about, first of all, keeping the virus out of school, but also if it gets in, making sure, you know, that it that it's low, lower level, if you see what I mean, or that people, you know, who've got the virus are taken out of school and quarantined until they're, until they're okay again. Okay, next. School operations. Now, I've talked a bit about school transport, but public transport is exactly the same. Different bus companies have got seem to have different, uh, you know, if your son uses uh, um, public transport, uh, you know, check with your, obviously, your bus company, you know, what, what, what are the procedures. Here in London, most of the bus companies insist on face coverings, and the tube does as well. Attendance. Is your son asked to attend 100% or have they started off by saying, oh, well, you know, it's okay. He only needs to come in one day a week. Now, you know, your son has a right to be in school for five mm -hmm. days a week for every minute. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't, don't please get fobbed off. Or, you know, I've heard someone say, oh, well, they said he could start three weeks after everyone else while we've got everything else sort of sorted out. Now, either that's never going to happen or they should have things sorted out right, right from the beginning. So your son has the right to attend school 100 percent of the time. I'll talk a bit, a little bit at the end about something called blended learning. Educational visits, it's. Uh, it seems like a lot of schools are just going to basically cancel them because, you know, because they're too risky. Uh, but your school might be doing visits. You know, again, if they are, what's in place uh, in order to be safe? School uniform, I put that in because, um, you know, cleaning, you know, your son's uh, uh, clothes uh, as often as possible is really important. Have the school considered that? Is it going to be all school uniform, you know, keeping, um, uh, you know, your kids school clothes, you know, clean and as possible is, is, is important. Extracurricular activities, are they going ahead, you know, after school clubs, after school activities? What, what procedures are in, in place to, to make it safe? Uh, 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 you know, are they, are they doing extracurricular activities in bubbles or, or so on, or have they scrapped them all together? Also, you know, extracurricular activities away from school, you know, places are starting to open, swimming pools and so on. Um, again, if you're, if you're using those, you know, check out what the procedures are uh, in terms of the risk assessments uh, that are in place in other centres. Okay, next. Oh, education provision. Now again, you know, as I said at the beginning, the boys will have lost uh, a lot of school and for certainly some of our boys, you know, they, they might well have fallen behind uh, significantly because of that. So what do you need to do to ensure that your son's gonna catch up and isn't gonna, you know, uh, isn't going to fall further behind. Will you need to review his education, health and care plan? Do you need further assessments? So assessments go into section B. So if he has fallen behind, you need assessments from teachers. Do you need educational psychologists, OT, speech therapy, uh, CAMS, uh, you know, for mental health difficulties? Have those, have you got up-to-date assessments to just to check to see where he is. Does that education, health and care plan need amending in terms of assessments? Is he lagging behind his peers in, liter in particular literacy, numeracy or uh, other, of the, other of his subjects? If he is, how far behind? What needs to be, what interventions need to be put in place to catch up? You know, Janet and I, you know, we've talked, and in Janet's book, we've talked a lot about these are high risk, areas in in Duchenne but if the boys are given you know good teaching and lots of practice you know they can catch up so it's really important to find out where he's at 
Has his mental health or behaviour been affected by being isolated at home? Uh, that it, it's very important. Um, you know, he might be very nervous. He might be mad to get back, but he also might be very nervous about getting back. So what's in place in school, you know, to help that, that process uh, uh, of going back into school? Who can he talk to? Who can he work with to make sure that, that he's okay uh, and um, is, is getting the best out of his education? Now, if, if you're going to review his education, health and care plan, then section F uh, is where the provision is mapped out and you really need to make sure that that's very specific and it's got interventions in place that are gonna, that are gonna specifically help him to catch up with literacy, numeracy, numeracy or, or any other things that he's doing. Don't have wishy-washy provision that just said, oh, well, you know, if we help him a little bit, he'll, he'll do fine. It's gotta be specific. Janet. I just wanted to check about if you wanted to put in provisions for COVID, you know, because of COVID in Section F, do you have to have a proper special educational needs review meeting to do to add that? Yeah, if you're going to review uh, his EHC plan, you, you need to uh, request uh, a review meeting that's going to look at uh, his plan in total and uh, any further assessments that need to be made and any provision that needs to be made. Yes, it's, yes, Jane, it's got to be done under a review. Uh, do you need up-to-date health uh, assessments? You know, I've talked about the importance of neuromuscular consultant. Uh, you know, they really need to be feeding into individual uh, risk assessments. But, uh, you know, uh, physios, OTs, you know, what have you got latest physio assessments? You know, and there's a big question about will physio be continued in school? What's your physio's advice on that? How important is it that your son gets physio in school? You need to consult your physiotherapist, the expert, and get them to write a letter to the school and say, if, it, if, if it's got to be done, then somebody needs to do it and this is how you do it. Do you need up-to-date social care assessments from your social worker? You know, how, have things changed at home? Do you need adaptations? Maybe a specialist OT? Do you need uh, domiciliary care? Do you need any, any other input? Because social care, health, education assessments are the core of your educational health and care plan. And, and that needs to be updated and once it's in that plan, it's mandatory. It has to be delivered by the school. Right, will all this education be in school or will the school offer uh, what's called blended learning? So some in school and some online. And you know, there, there is a move, uh, you know, sometimes, some of the online uh, teaching and learning has been successful. Some of it hasn't been so successful, maybe, it's something that you and the school might might choose to do that uh, he that your son can go into school for a, a number of days and be offered online uh, teaching and follow up programs. But the key question is: Are these programs meeting his needs that have been assessed and 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 provision in place? Is he making is he making progress? Uh, whether whether he's in school full time or whether he's in school part time and doing blended learning, you've got to really, really be on the case of that and not not let that slip. Okay, next. Okay, uh, that kind of concludes the, uh, the the checklist. I hope everyone finds that helpful. Thank you so much, Nick. We are going to come to you for questions and a discussion in a few moments. Um, but we just thought we might go to Alex Clark now, who um, is, is on the Trinity Case Patient Advisory Board, and he <clears throat> is going to share with us the journey that he's had to get his son's school ready for returning after, after the summer holidays and the coronavirus break. So over to you, Alex. Right. Um, thanks very much, Emily. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, I think it has been a journey and there was obviously a lot of anxiety right at the beginning around sending back in, Ben in, back into school. 
Um, and so we, um, we took a number of steps to make sure that this could happen because um, our overriding feeling is, and I'm not sure how other families feel about this, but Ben's mental health has suffered greatly over this time in lockdown. And I'm sure a lot of other parents are in the same boat. And we felt that there would be a lot of benefit from him being around his friends and also being in um, a, a learning situation that wasn't um, ruled by his dad. <laughs> um, so we, we um, straight after we had his educational healthcare plan um, review for COVID, we actually scheduled a further date for post COVID um, educational healthcare plan review uh, with the council. So that's already in the diary <clears throat> to make sure that any measures that were put in are um, followed up and that actually we, we have been on track. So from a learning point of view, we can make sure that, um, that he is being supported from, from a learning point of view. Um, and then we consulted with the Senko, the head, his class teacher, all of whom we've had video conferences with during lockdown prior to schools closing for the summer holidays. And we also have dates in the diary for within the, within the first week of returning to school about how things are going for Ben. We have just received today actually the risk assessment from the school, their risk assessment for returning to school, um, which covers most of the things that Nick has um, brought up, which has really been really good for me. It's really put my heart at ease. Um, but there were a few key questions that we put in and wanted to know. Um, so those consultations are really important. Would his teaching assistant be working with him? And that was confirmed it would be going ahead to ensure that we were meeting his education health care plan needs. Um, what are the bubbles going to look like? Would it be a class group? Would it just be a year group? Um, and they're, they're defining that as class groups because they've got a number of vulnerable children in the school. So they're keeping them as small as possible. They've done a one-way system for drop-offs and pickups, staggered entry, staggered in exit times. Um, the, there are face masks available for his TA. Ben has his own face covering. Um, uniforms, um, you know, these are all things that, that Nick's covered, but uniforms, he going to school in his uniform, needs to be cleaned every day. If he has PE, he goes in his PE kit. If he's forest school, he goes in his forest school kit and doesn't have to wear a uniform. And that, and that applies for the whole school. That's not just for him. So sort of from every aspect they've been thinking, making sure that it's clean, neat and tidy. Um, so there've been a lot of good things. We've also been very fortunate. And I think, you know, this is, and I, and I must make it very clear, I am talking about my son here. And I know everybody's situation is different. And depending where you are geographically, um, your situation is different. We're in South Oxfordshire, which has quite low cases. And we're also in a situation where we've been able to go back and see some of Ben's clinicians, including his neurologist. And so we've managed to get clinical advice about, you know, their feelings on Ben returning back to school and given where Ben is and where his, uh, his, where his health is, as far as you know, all, of his, um, all of his scans, all of his checks, all of his balances, um, they feel that uh, the risk is at, on the lower scale, and so it's actually safe for Ben to return to school. I cannot stress, though, the need for you to um, consult with your medical professionals about your son and where you are in the journey, and he is in the journey as, as to it being safe and ma making sure that you consult with the school because that's really put our heart at ease. And just to end off, um, as Nick has said, your, your son is entitled to full-time education. He's also entitled to an education and healthcare plan. And without Nick, Janet, Decipher, Deshane UK, and the work that, and the guidance that Nick and Decipher have given us, we would not be in this position and feel so comfortable about sending Ben back to school. Um, and I say comfortable, that's caveated with we are still in the global pandemic and we have to consider that but um, i would absolutely recommend consulting with nick any questions that don't get answered tonight make sure you get his details contact him it's very responsive um very knowledgeable him and janet have so much experience around this and um as much as it's a really really difficult task um, and is very time consuming. They really take a lot of the weight off um, and they've really helped us get the buy-in of our school. Um, so I would absolutely recommend using the cipher um, and uh, making sure that you're in a position where you feel comfortable sending your child back to school. Thank you so much, Alex. That was really helpful. And um, yes, just to remind everyone that the cipher is, is funded by Duchenne UK. So if you do want to use 
um, their excellent service, then um, you know you don't you don't have to pay for it. Um, so I'm very pleased to see Alex Johnson's face pop up on the panel. Um, she, I'm now going to hand over to her to um, take control of the questions. So if you do want to ask a question either raise your hand or you can type one in the Q&A bar. Um, but I think she's been emailed some questions beforehand. So over to you, Alex. Uh, apologies for the delay. We've had wild cows in the backfield knocking out power lines. So um, yes, an interesting night. So thank you so much, Nick, um, for your presentation and also Alex for your thoughts. I think, you know, that's been very helpful. Um, I don't know if any parents want to type any questions into the Q&A that I can read out or if any participants want to press the raise hand button, we can open the line and you can ask your questions directly. Um, I can see that Rachel Hansen has got um, a raised hand so I don't know if her line can be open to ask a question. I haven't got a raised hand. What? <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know if I were asked. Well I don't know what I've done. Oh, right. <laughs> don't worry. What? I don't know why there's a raised hand there never mind. Well if anybody wants to raise the hand um, they're more than welcome to do that. So Nick, you've answered quite a lot of the questions that have come that have already come in, but I'm just going to sort of recap on some of them to provide people with reassurance. So the first question is, is it down to parental discretion on sending children back to school? Um, yeah. Uh, it, well, um, you know, the law is that, you know, children should be uh, in full-time education, uh, but they, interestingly, um, it doesn't have to be uh, in a school, so they can be kind of home tutored and, you know, there's various other kind of options, but it, but it, you know, the current situation is that the government are saying it's mandatory that uh, young people uh, you know go back to school in September and although they don't they say they don't want to fine you they they will if they don't think that your son is in any kind of educational setting okay I, I had quite a good conversation with our local authority and they you know i think it's about having those conversations with school and your local authority because they said at this stage if i still um don't feel comfortable sending jack back to school they will not find me you know they're willing to have that conversation with me and work with me so i think opening up those conversations if you don't feel comfortable is is very important um so a question that well, nick you might be able to help with sorry go on no, sorry, just to come back on that. Yeah, but then, you know, so if you decide not to send your uh, son into school, you know, you, you, ha you have to come up with some kind of alternative provision, which is, which is fine. And if, if you've got an education, health and care plan, you know, that the local authority needs to find a way of, of delivering that educational provision to you with um i didn't mention tutors in my in my talk but you know there there was a there was talk about uh, the government providing funding for for home tutors so uh it you know that's great what you said alex because it's worth exploring with your local authority if after you know going through all of this uh, and you really don't feel happy with what your school's put in place and you and you know, and I don't blame you for feeling very worried, um, but make sure that the local authority is going to provide education for your son. Yeah, I agree. Um, one question that we've had in, is there anything extra that could be considered for my son returning to university? So I don't know if there's anything that you've been thinking about with Sol that, that's different. Well, I mean, the universities don't seem to have decided exactly what they're doing now at the moment, but 
um, halls of residence seem to be um, sort of sorting it out in bubbles so that each flat or corridor stays together and, and doesn't mix with other corridors, whether that's going to be <laughs> possible, I don't know. Um, I think seminars are going to be a bit of dual delivery. I think there's going to be teaching online and in small groups, but I mean, I think it's just about finding out and talking to the, the program leaders uh, about how things are going to be administered over the term. Um, we don't know any more than that, really. No, it's, it's really up in the air. I mean, in my workplace, it's totally up in the air as well. They're talking about dual delivery, but nothing. I was at a meeting this afternoon and nothing seems to be sort of totally fixed yet. But really, the, mm. the same sorts of questions apply you know, that we've just been through would apply to, you know, going back to university. Um, we've... Yeah, can we... I don't... Ellen, could you open up um, Claire's um, line? She's got a university follow-up question she'd like to ask. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Claire. Yeah. Hi, Claire. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just going to add, because... I've got two sons, so Jack's 20, and as regards Birmingham University, um, they're doing a kind of a, um, I think Jack's concluded that it's unlikely he will go back the first term of university. Most of it will be online, um, mm -hmm. and there has been some discussions with the disability officer, as you mentioned about bubbles within the accommodation. Mm. And currently there's been some discussion because Jack has been in the shielding category, like most of the douche gen, uh, that going forwards that potentially he will be accessing his university accommodation with just his support staff. Um, so effectively an isolated bubble um, and that going forwards that it will be mostly uh, practicals because he's studying biology that he would return to university for. Um, right. We've had other added stresses around PPE, accessing that for support staff um, because of use of a new cough assist machine. Um, we've had lots of issues because all of his staff are BAME, uh, which makes it even more complicated. Um, and obviously the issue of the fact that we live here in Nottingham, which is where Jack is at present, um, and obviously the locality of Birmingham, where I think the numbers of COVID cases are going up. But mm. I, I would say that you need, if your child, young person is at university, the disability officer, they need to have a conversation with them. Yeah. I think a lot of the universities are realising that overseas students, there won't be as many. So that potentially will help with the accommodation issue. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Okay. With um, Janet Blur, do you want to um, comment as well? I know you wrote some comments. Um. Yeah, it, it's a big question as to how you handle university. And I think it really is down to the individual site. I mean, we, as I say, I've put my questions, we've been offered either six hours face-to-face, -face, no big lecture halls, or online, or any hybrid Philip chooses to pick, really. Um, we have a PA, he lives in halls, the PA is next door. Um, and of course, when, when the universities are deciding the little bubbles of students, they have to take the PAs into consideration as well, because they're another body in the room, of course. I think, basically, we're just feeling our way towards this. And he doesn't start till the 5th of October. So quite frankly, anything could change. No, thanks, Janet. Um, we've got Becky Littler um, has put, if online learning continues as part of blended learning, 
Would I be right in thinking that the school should still provide appropriate one-to-one -one support to my son to understand and complete work online? Also, that adjustments are made to the setting of the work to meet my son's individual needs. I don't know if Nick, you could, and Janet could comment on that. Yeah, no, def definitely. If if there's one-to-one -one support um, in your education as a care plan, then that can be delivered online. You know, that can be de delivered through Zoom meetings. Uh, you, you know, so um, a class teacher or a uh, teaching assistant really should be. You know, if your you know if your son's at home for a portion of the week or even the whole week. You know they they should be on they should be on line with you every day, making sure that the work that's been set you know the young person understands that it's followed up checked up that um, you know that they're giving them lots of encouragement emotional support uh, and so on just as they would in school. I think what has happened during the lockdown is that uh, you know we've we've lost a lot of that. That's just kind of disappeared because you know no one's really thought about how to uh, how to deliver that uh, as a blended learning or, or online support but it really really does need to happen and, and if it's in your education health and care plan it's mandatory uh, the school have got resources for it so classroom teachers and TAs need to have to make time to set up work if your son is working from home really important yeah definitely um another question so um i'm just going to read this out school is saying that we're going to have two teaching assistants one in the morning and a different one in the afternoon just wondered what your thoughts are i'm saying no as it's going to cause greater exposure when they're supposed to be in classroom bubbles I mean, speaking as Jack's mum, I would prefer him to just have one TA. Nick, would you agree? Yeah, I, I would. Obviously, for COVID measures, that would be, uh, uh, you know, it does reduce risk. Uh, in terms of, you know, outside of COVID, it's probably better young people, you know, do get used to working with, with different people and they're not just glued next to the same person all the time. Uh, but these are exceptional circumstances and I think you need to, you know, the school needs to think about reorganising its, itself so that, uh, you know, in every circumstance we're reducing the risk of, uh, of infections, we're reducing, you know, the virus load on, on both young people and staff. So but it, it's about getting back to the head teacher really and yeah. you know trying to negotiate this yeah um so this is um you covered this a little bit in the presentation but i'm just going to ask we're conscious that our son has fallen further behind with his learning during lockdown he's going into year eight at high school in september what should we expect requests from the school to further help him close the wider gap should the local authority also be picking up costs for some additional private home tuition? Yeah, I think so, definitely. I think all our boys, particularly in this situation where, you know, there is a, uh, you know, there is a risk that, they, that they've fallen significantly behind. Uh, and I think that they, they would really benefit from, you know, a private tutor, uh, you know, uh, supporting particularly young people who are struggling with literacy or, or maths but any you know if, if the young people are uh, starting to do GCSE courses and that sort of thing you know they, they would also benefit from um, you know private tuition and you know that we should you know what what Alex said earlier about what what he's managed to do in Oxford is, is a fantastic example uh, to for us all to think about and follow is because to get those uh, you know get in early with the review of, of your education health and care plan you know if you haven't done it then ask for a, a review and then get it reviewed again and 
you know, in, in that review, you've got to say, you know, I, I get I have a strong feeling he's fallen behind, let's say with his reading or, or so on. I want a teacher assessment. I want an educational psychologist assessment. I want to know exactly where he is, how far he's got behind. And I want to know what intervention, what reading program, what intervention that you've got in place that's going to help him catch up. And we think, you know, you, I think you need to say that you also think that to make that happen, you know, he needs some really intensive uh, tutoring over and above what he might be getting at, at school and ask the local, you know, kind of make a demand, if you like, that the local authority puts that into the education, health and care plan. Once it's in there, guys, it's mandatory. If you can get it in there and, and give him a maths tutor one hour, two hours a week or something, and the local authority then have to pay for it once it's in the EHC plan. So it's about, it's what Alex said, it's about, that process. it's about that process of, you know, reviewing where is it, where he is, showing that COVID has massively uh, disadvantaged him and, and getting provision in place that's going to help him catch up. And don't be shy. You know, we need the TAs working with them. We need the class teachers in there sorting things out. Um, putting good interventions in programs in place and if you can well not if you can ask for for you know individual tuition even if they only give it for say six months it, it's worth asking for yeah. um, Alex I'm not sure if you can see that Anna Chadwick has raised her hand can we unmute her can we unmute Anna yep hi can you hear me yeah, hi Anna. Say something. Hello. Hiya. Oh, hi Alex. Oh. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Hi. Um, I just got a quick question, really. Um, during the COVID, when the kids were indoors in lockdown, um, some schools provide a certain amount of one-on-one uh, -on -one learning, um, through Zoom. Uh, my question is, is that it may happen again and it's a second wave and we have to be chilled in which is kind of possible how many hours we should be expecting from the school uh, in terms of support because obviously at school there's a one-on-one -on -one, so you get mostly the whole week cover but um during lockdown they made the reasonable um, adjustments so they were only giving like three hours a week which i, I didn't felt it was enough no it's not enough Anna, you're absolutely right. That's not enough. If it's in his uh, education, health and care plan that he's got one-to-one -one support for, I don't know, say 23 hours, then, then that's what, you know, that's what he should be getting. He should be getting that, uh, whether he's in school or out of school online. The problem was with the lockdown was that they changed the law, didn't they? So that that you could only have a reasonable, they use that word reasonable, and so they managed to get away really with not giving the support that the city did. That's the thing I had a problem with because reasonable, you know, mean different things for them than I mean for us. Obviously, my school was quite good and I had this discussion and they update hours, you know, oh, to have yeah. cope. But I'm just thinking, you know, come on again if we have to be on shielding or say, you know, someone gets ill on the class and they send us all home for two weeks. Then, um, you know, just to make sure the school is prepared to deliver that, what we have to isolate. Um, so I just wonder what yeah, well, happening. At the moment, you know, it's law that your young person has the right to everything that's in his educational health and care plan. So unless that gets changed again, hopefully, then you'll still have the right to all that, however they're, however they're going to do it, whether it's online or face to face. Yeah, I, and I think going, going back right from the very beginning of the webinar, that, um, you know, what, what's really, really important here is that I, I don't think with any intention, but young people with disabilities and certainly our kids they tend they tend you know to get kind of left at the end of everyone's considerations and i mean you know this is why we've as parents we've always had to you know fight our son's corner all the time because you know you if you don't contact that head teacher if you don't intervene if you don't get your education health and care plan reviewed it will get left you know, schools and 
a lot of head you know a lot of head teachers are under so much pressure trying to get all this organized i i have a lot of sympathy for them i mean some of them must be going through hell trying to trying to ma manage all this and on limited resources and uh, you know and, and but you know the the real life situation is you don't get in there and you don't start asking questions and you don't start making demands and you don't start you know in a in a reasonable way insisting that your that your education health and care plan provision is implemented if he's got 23 hours of a ta then that's you know that he he needs to have that and if the school are not delivering it now you can appeal that because it's not you know as janet just said it's now mandatory that they have to provide it so bear that in mind you know when you're going through this you know really difficult situation thank you very much nick and i just got something else just as a form of information um it may help some other parents um during the whole lockdown we have to stay shielding and uh, some local authorities contacted the school and they provided a laptop um for the children to use at home so you know usually that we use our own laptop or you know a, a pc at home but the school actually um requested um that help so because they couldn't use the laptop that goes back and forth from school because of contamination um they provided a laptop solely for the child to use at home um if we have to be on lockdown again then then we have that already set up at home so i just in case they help another parent or you know someone is on need of a laptop they can always um, approach the school and ask thank you so much anna um, i'm afraid we're coming to the end of the recording we've already got 30 seconds left i want to thank uh, yeah. nick and janet for doing such a comprehensive job and alex for sharing his stories just to let you know, Nick's working on a risk assessment, which is a really useful document that we're having reviewed by our patient advisory board at the moment, um, to give you a list of things you need to ask the school. So we will make that available on the website um, as soon as we possibly can. I've now got 13 seconds to say thank you all so much and to the dedicated team of Duchenne Cape for making today happen. Uh, this is actually our 12th webinar and it's five months to the day that we did our first one. So thank you all for dialing in and stay safe. Ha <laughs> ha.